Welcome back to the uh, Holiday Lectures on Science, the 2005 Holiday Lectures. We've been covering the topic of evolution, and we're having a, a discussion session this afternoon um, on the topic of reconciling religious beliefs with the evidence for evolution. And um, you should all be familiar with our speakers uh, from the series, David Kingsley of Stanford University and Sean Carroll of uh, University of Wisconsin. They'll be joining us for this discussion this afternoon as well. But I wanted to introduce a couple of um, special guest discussants that have agreed to join us. Um, and they're going to, each of them will give a brief introduction to the topic to just give you some orientation towards some of the thinking and the ideas uh, that are out there. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Father James Wiseman. Uh, Father Wiseman is a Catholic monk of the Order of St. Benedict, and he's also Associate Professor of Theology uh, at Catholic University right here in Washington, D.C. Um, he's actually the former abbot of St. Anselm's Monastery in Washington, D.C., where I believe he still resides. Uh, and he's the former president of the Monastic Interreligious Dialogue, um, and he currently serves as editor of the MID Bulletin. Um, and although uh, Father Wiseman is a um, theologian who's particularly interested in reconciling modern science, um, his specialty is actually Christian spirit spirituality. And I wanted to uh, point out uh, a book that he's written called Theology and Modern Science. So if you're interested in some of the ideas that we talk about uh, today, this would be a good book to, um, to uh, find in your local bookstore. Our other special uh, guest is uh, Dr. Michael Ruse. Um, he's uh, uh, really become, uh, even though not originally trained as a, science, a scientist, he's uh, an authority on uh, our Darwinian evolution and ev evolutionary thought. Um, he's Lucille Workmeister Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Program in History and Philosophy of Science at Florida State University in Tallahassee. And he's taught, uh, before moving to Florida, he taught for many years uh, in Canada at the University of Guelph. Um, he has many books to his credit, but I think a particularly relevant one for today's discussion is um, a book he recently authored called Can a Darwinian uh, Be a Christian? Um, so again, if uh, anything said today uh, uh, really interests you, that these would be good books to follow up on to get some more detail. And of course, they both have lots of references in them. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, in, uh, ask Father Wiseman to come to the podium and uh, start us off with some introductory remarks, and then he'll hand things over to, uh, to Dr. Ruse. In addition to teaching at Catholic University, I also teach in a high school at the St. Anselm's Abbey School, and one of my students is here. I taught class there this morning and missed him, but now I know why he was absent from class and not really <laughs> playing hooky. At any rate, when um, Dennis Liu asked me to make a little presentation here, he said one point I should address is whether a Christian can accept biological evolution. And the short answer to that is certainly. It might even be that some of you use in your courses a best-selling biology textbook by a believing Christian and a Catholic, Kenneth Miller. You might also have heard that the late Pope, John Paul II, gave a, a very important talk about maybe seven, eight years ago in which he pointed out that evolution is very much a well-established theory, not just an hypothesis, and that there is absolutely no reason, why, certainly why a member of my own denomination, a, a, a Catholic, could not accept that as a, as a well-founded theory. But if that's the case, then you might ask, well, why is it then that a good many religious people, including quite a few Christians, do reject the theory? Well, there are lots of reasons, and there's no need to go into all of them. I think one common reason is people, some people accept the early chapters of the, of the Bible, the book of Genesis, as very literal. In my opinion, that's simply misunderstanding what a scripture is. It's not a science textbook. But if you take it quite literally, you might assume that human beings have been around only for a few thousand years. And uh, as I think you know, and I believe Dr. Carroll pointed it out, there are a 
millions of Americans who truly believe that. Uh, another difficulty, and I think a somewhat more sophisticated and challenging one is that the whole element of randomness in evolutionary theory to some people seems incompatible, at least with the Christian notion of divine providence, that, that in some way God is not only the creator and maintainer, but also the goal of all creation and of the universe. But in my opinion, that difficulty, people who raise that difficulty, are simply confusing two kinds of causality. When, when classical theologians, for example, St. Thomas Aquinas, speak of God as the primary cause, that's not at all on the same level as the kind of causes that scientists study, whether they be physicists or chemists or biologists. It, it, it's, a, it's a mixing of theology and science in a way that I think is not valid. Now, it's true that some scientists claim that science is the only valid avenue to knowledge. But anyone who would claim that would be doing it not as scientist, but rather as a representative of something of, that sounds a bit similar, but I, it's called scientism. And uh, you, that, that's simply altogether different from, um, from what I myself would hold as a believing Christian and someone who totally accepts evolutionary theory. Now, what makes arguments and issues in theology or philosophy somewhat difficult and why it leads to heated exchanges, in my opinion, is that so much is based on fundamental assumptions. There, there, some of you have probably heard of a, a well-known and highly respected physicist down at the University of Texas, Steven Weinberg. Some years ago, he wrote an often quoted sentence in which he said that the more we learn of the universe, the more pointless it seems. Well, for such a person, the universe is simply here, uncaused, totally unexplainable. There didn't even exist any potentiality for its existence. It's just a total, absolute mystery. For me, it philosophically makes more sense to say this potentiality that anything at all exists lies in the power of God. But I do realize that words like that would not convince someone who already has the fundamental basic assumption that everything is ultimately pointless or absurd anyway. For, for that reason, I would say issues like divine creation belong primarily in philosophy classes or theology classes, while the theory of evolution belongs primarily in biology classes. It's true that data from the natural sciences can have an influence on one's philosophical or theological or religious position. That was, for example, the case recently when a well-known British philosopher named Anthony Flew declared that his study of natural science after many, many years had led him from atheism to a religious position that's usually called deism. But I think it's important to notice that that change of mind on his part was brought about on the level of philosophy and not on that of science. Now, I, I've said very, very little and tried to cram it into four minutes. But uh, after several more introductory presentations, if you have some questions, I'd be delighted to speak with you further.